Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, you, most of you know me um, uh, through the um, homeless ministry. I'm usually up here announcing um, what, when we're going to go to homeless ministry. But today, I'm up here to give you my testimony. And I might get emotional. I don't know. I have friends of mine who know me. I'm usually very emotional. So, so hang in there with me. Um, <laughs> this is too early to start crying, but, but sorry, maybe I'll get the crying out of the way soon. But um, I pray that through my testimony today, I don't glorify me. I know it might sound like it at points because it's the story of my life and how I came here. Um, but I want you to know that this is only to glorify God. It's only to let you know who he is and how he works in your hearts to bring you to him and how much he loves you. So, so I'm just going to start with a prayer first to calm myself down and we're going we're gonna to start. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for your Sabbath, for the day that is the day we come to you. And it's your day that we spend this day with you, Father. I pray as I am up here to do my testimony. I pray that you give me the strength. You give me the ability to, to be a witness to you, to what you have done in my life. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will fill my heart and, and guide me. Speak through me, Father. Speak through me so that I can bring what you have done in my life and, and to hopefully open eyes, open ears, and open hearts and soften hearts that, I, that have been hardened against you, Father. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I'm going to start my story. As I was putting my um, testimony together, I... Um, it was just like putting a puzzle together. So um, um, when I went back to look at it, I was like, wow, there are so many miracles, so many miracles that I did not even look at them as miracles at the time. I just thought, oh, it, just, it was just luck. It just happened. Oh, I'm here, I'm there, whatever. But um, um, I looked at it, and at the beginning, I, um, I wanted to start with my birth story. And even my birth was, I realized even my birth was, um, was a miracle. Uh, because um, I was born in 1964 um, in Tehran, Iran, um, which the picture of uh, my, my city is behind the picture somewhere. Um, and it's, it's, that's where I was born. Uh, it's a beautiful city. Right now it's filled with high rises. But when I was born there, it was beautiful. And, um, and my, the story of my birth was that I, my parents had, um, had a daughter um, as their first child. And, and around when she was three and a half years old, unfortunately, they lost her. Um, because of cancer, and at those days, you know, there was not that much cure, there was not that much to do about it, and they realized it so late, and they lost her, and they were so hurt by losing her, they were, they were just, uh, from what I heard, they were just, for months and months, my dad was sobbing all night long, so anyways, they always wanted, you know, they had two boys after that, and uh, they're my brothers who are six and seven years older than me. So uh, they wanted to have a girl. It was just their wish to have a girl. And that's where my name comes from. My name is Arman, and in Farsi it means wish. So they, um, they um, um, prayed and prayed, and they, they wanted a girl. So finally God gave me. But during the time that my mom was pregnant with me, she um, had to go through some huge procedures, some health problems. And she had to have some major x-rays uh, done at the time that um, it was very sensitive time for fetus to grow. So the doctors basically told them, you know, um, 
your, your kid, whoever, whatever, the girl or the boy, is probably either not going to be born or is just going to have major problems, whether developmentally, whether their brain is not going to be developed. And, and here I was. Uh, you know, at the time, there was no ultrasound, so I was born, and, and, and they just, um, you know, they were so happy to have a girl. And that, that by itself, to me, as I was putting this on the paper, I realized what a miracle that was, that God, God brought me to, to this world for a reason, for a reason. And, and interestingly, thinking about it, where I am from, from Iran, from the country that is so, so much politically right now, things are going on. Think about it. I had no idea at the time, of course, I didn't know anything about Christianity, that that is the country that's Persia. That's the country that Cyrus and Darius and, and all the kings who actually overthrown Babylon came from. And now that I know the history and the story, I, I am just amazed. I am just amazed. So I came from a family with, uh, with parents that were very loving. I had a very humble parents, very charitable, always, always giving. And on my birthdays, I remember they used to give um, uh, food and, and clothing and money to the poor. They used to always, that was their every year on top of the other times. So, so it, was a, it was a beautiful childhood that I had. And... Um, and I grew up uh, in nature, you know, always camping, always picnics and everything. And it was a beautiful life. And I went to elementary school in a Catholic school. It was an Italian school, supposedly, but Catholic school. But it was a private school, and that's why they put me there. I was not, you know, we were, we were not Christians or anything. And um, the, the most things that I saw over there from Christianity was just the students who were Christians would go to a little church that the uh, school had. And we, you know, a, a other one of us, we didn't do anything. We were just, we were just there. And uh, I was born in a Muslim, in a Muslim country and in a Muslim family, you know, supposedly, officially, uh, we were Muslims, uh, because when you're born in a Muslim family, you're a Muslim. And, and you know, it wasn't um, the kind of family that we were practicing uh, Islam, but, you know, we were Muslims. And um, the, only, the only person who was really a devout Muslim in my, um, in my family was my grandfather, uh, my mom's dad. And to this day, he, I can say that he's been the kindest person I have ever met in my whole life. Because everything to him was for God. Everything, everything, anything good, good happens, thank God, thank God. And, and um, he was surrendered to God, no matter what happened. Anything bad happened, the same thing. He was like, I am just surrendered to God. The tradition in Iran was, as far as being a Muslim, uh, at least from what I had experienced, was that um, you, would, you would not have a communication, you would not have a communion necessarily with God on a daily basis, like how we pray. Um, it was just, you would, you would pray five times a day if you were a devout Muslim, but it was in Arabic. Most, of, most people don't even know what it means. And um, they would just pray five times and they would fast during Ramadan. But you really didn't have that relationship with God on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And, um, and I did, I remember when I was 11 years old or so, I, uh, I did the same thing. I started praying five times a day, and I really wanted to become a devout Muslim. And after a few months, I, I didn't anymore because I realized I'm not, even, I'm not even understanding what I'm saying. You know, I could go and try to memorize, but it was just, it was just not. Uh, so you would come to God when you would have problems, when uh, things would go wrong, when somebody would die. You would always kind of run to God at that, at that point, but not on a daily basis to have communion with him. So I fast forward until uh, when I was 15 years of age. Um, uh, the Iranian revolution happened. The Islamic revolution in Iran happened in 1979. And um, at that time, I was in high school. It was pretty much the beginning of my, my high school. And I had a cousin 
that uh, she was in medical school and she was like a sister to me. So she started um, going to the demonstrations and, uh, and going to the streets uh, that the shootings were happening and the whole revolutionary thing was happening. And she um, got me um, introduced to um, uh, communism and, and um, atheism and all those stuff. I, I loved her. And I was a teenager being somebody who's so, um, you know, at that age, you're so passionate about everything. So I, um, I became a communist. I became an atheist, a communist, you know, in my mind as a teenager. Uh, so I started reading all Marx and uh, Lenin and all those books and stuff. And I was completely a follower and, and a big, uh, I was so big about evolution uh, theory. I was like, wow, yeah, we were, you know, it's all evolution. We all evolved from monkeys and this and that. So I was a, a, a big proponent of that. And... Um, during those days, now that I look back, those days, surviving those streets, those demonstrations, there were bullets, there were shootings, there were people being trampled underneath uh, each other's feet, and that was, again, I realized, wow, that was, that was miraculous. God, God saved, you know, me, my cousin, all the people that we were together. He, he saved us. I mean, so many people died. So many people died during those demonstrations. And so what happened is that, uh, again, fast forward, the war started. The war between Iran and Iraq started. I, I remember that night clearly. I was, um, we had a party, we cleaned up, we went to bed, and around 2.30 a.m., we woke up with this sound of bombs and, and uh, the anti-aircraft artilleries that were as, as, as loud as bombs, and we woke up with that, so panicked out and so scared, and this continued, of course, it continued for 10 years, this war who killed um, so many people, so many innocent people from both sides, and so it's such a useless war that it was, but I remember again, those, those nights and those days that the sirens would go off, uh, we were we were running to the basements, and we were just um, again we come to God at that point, but uh, praying to God to save us so that the bombs won't fall on our house. And and there were so many times that the bombs fell on other people's houses, and so many people got killed, and it got worse as I left Iran. Also, but again, here we go, miracles of God. He, he saved us through all those bombings and through all that chaos that was happening. Then it was time for entry exam to university. In Iran, getting into universities, at least at that time, it was not that easy. You had this huge national exam that you had to pass, and you, ch you choose your uh, whatever you want to study, you put it in like levels and say, okay, my first choice is this, my second is this. So I had to study, and I uh, participated in that exam, and my, my first choice was physical therapy. Julie, you will be proud of me. <laughs> that, was, that was my first choice. But, um, but because of the war and the situation that was going on, they, they needed a lot of nurses because it was, it was just horrible, the situation out there. So they put me in nursing. I started a nursing college, university, and um, the, the war was so bad. The chemical weapons started, and it was so horrible that um, I could not continue. I went for a year, but uh, it was so many contagious diseases happening, skin to skin, and, and it was just a horrible time. So, so unfortunately, I quit nursing school. And at the same time, the um, har harassment of the government, of the Islamic government, was really, really increasing. So they, would, they had these cars on the streets uh, filled with their people, and, um, and they would watch and, and follow you, whatever you were doing. You could be just walking normally, and they would just stop you and ask you, what are you doing? Why are...? So my only 
getting my, um, you know, getting my exercise was just walking on those streets of my, my hometown, which was all hilly and beautiful, and I used to get my exercise for a few hours a day. They started harassing so bad. They started stopping me every day and, and just asking me, why is your hair showing? Why are you walking like this? You shouldn't be walking. Like, why are you alone? So the harassments got so bad. And at the same time, they, um, they arrested my mom. They put her in jail for wearing a pantyhose that according to them, she was going to a wedding with my dad and everybody, and they said, your pantyhose is too thin. So they just took her right before she went to the wedding, and they took her to jail. They kept her for 48 hours. And, um, you know, luckily my cousin was a well-known surgeon in Iran, so he had, he found some connections and they got her out, but um, the stories of that jail were horrible. She was telling us after she came out, first of all, she, so, she was such a fragile person, she was so thin and so fragile, she went on a hunger strike in the, in the, in the prison. Um, to oppose this whole thing. And she came home and she was so thin, like a skeleton. And she said they were opening uh, these gas chambers as they were sleeping in the prison or as they were resting. And they were, um, then they would sm smell the, uh, the gas, the, uh, you know, uh, whatever it was, and they would panic. They were all like, oh, they're gonna kill us, they're gonna kill us, and then they would stop. So a few hours later, again, and it was just this mental torture that they were doing to these prisoners. So she came out, the moment she got home, she only drank water, and she said, she picked up the phone and she called my brother. My brother came about a year and a half, two years before that to, U to US. And she called him and she said, Kevin, you're, you're going to take your sister out of here. You're going to take her out of here because if they, if they take her to these prisons as they took me, I'm just going to die. I'm just going to die. I can't believe what's going on. You need to get her out of here in whatever way that you can. And I, you know, I was shocked. I did not want to leave my, pa I was very attached to my parents, to my mom especially. And I was, I loved my hometown. I loved, I loved everything about there. I didn't want to leave, but I had to. The situation was really bad. So, so I, I, I ended up, I had to leave. But um, the, at the same time, the story of my brother had, it, had its own miracles. The miracles, that he was a physician. He became a physician in Iran. He finished his medical school. And he, um, um, what happened is that in Iran, especially at those days, you had to do 10 years of um, practice in, uh, in poor villages or villages that are afflicted by war and diseases. So after his medical school ended, he had to go to those villages. And because of the war, it was just, it was his death sentence. So my parents sold so many of their stuff. They made some money for him to, to actually just get him out of the border, to, to just practically send him out uh, through these guys that took the money. And, and the way they got out of the country was, again, miracle of God. They wrapped them. They wrapped them and put them between rugs. In, in this big truck, and they just kept them there for these hours and hours that they, were ha they had to pass through the roads and get to the border, and they were government people. There was shootings going on and everything. My brother, when, when they tell us the story, it's just, it's just crazy. He said, every minute we were thinking we're going to die. You know, we, we could hear the shooting, but we were wrapped between the rugs. We don't know what's going on. So, um, so he, he made it to U.S. He was, um, for a while, he was in Portugal and Spain and Mexico, and finally he got his visa. And um, again, miracles of God, you know, he made it to, to, to U.S. And, but, but he came with no documents. You have to remember this. He came with no documents. So he couldn't even prove that he's a physician because they wouldn't give it to him. So... I'll leave it there for, for that part. Um, and um, then it was my turn to get my visa. 
another miracle happened. I went to Turkey. Um, we, um, the, the airports were closed, everything was closed, so we had to come with a bus from, um, to go from Iran to Turkey. We got there, uh, they gave us appointment for two months from there, we were there, and, and um, the situation of the embassy in U.S. was that um, they were, um, there were two people at the time in that embassy. One was a gentleman who was extremely um, easygoing. Um, basically, visas were really impossible, but at least he was nice enough to give people another chance, go get this document, go get that document. But there was a lady also working there who um, was very, supposedly very mean. Not mean, but she was very difficult to give uh, visas. So I, when it was my turn, of course, I go in there and who did I get? I got the lady who was very difficult and I was like, and you have to know that I did not, because my brother just made it to US, he did not even have any connections to, and the way this, this thing was rushed that my mom said, get your sister out of here, he did not even have to get the application ready. He just mailed us an application blank with just my name on it and nothing else. No acceptance from the university. This was from Santa Monica College. So I went to embassy with practically no, um, no documents and... Um, and this lady um, looked at me, uh, you know, she talked to me for a while. She, she turned out to be, at least with me, she was a very nice lady. We talked for a while, she was really impressed at how I can speak English, you know, coming from Iran. And, and, and what happened is that she said, you don't have any documents for me to give you your visa, but I'm giving you the visa. There is something that is just telling me that I need to give you the visa. And it was, it was just, I could not believe it. I could not believe. I came out of the embassy and everybody's like, oh, they were sure that I didn't because everybody was coming out with, you know, with tearful eyes. And, and I was like, I got my visa. And nobody, nobody could believe it. So miracles of him, miracles of him. And he was just, he was just making the way. He was just making the way. So I came to USA, you know, my, my brother was working uh, at the time in a, in a little house, in a house, actually a big house, that a 103-year-old um, Russian lady who was very uh, well off, um, they, they hired him uh, to, um, to be kind of a medical person there, even though he didn't have any documents. Again, another miracle of God. They, they believed him and they, they saw that he was capable of doing it. So there were nurses around the clock who were taking care of this lady and my brother was there and I joined him. And um, that's another story, just how my brother, what, what um, sacrifices he made for me. To, to be here for him to support me. He, I remember just one example is that, and I don't know if he's ever gonna watch this, but I hope he does, because I remember he was giving bone marrows. He was giving bone marrows at times to, to support me, because we did not have much. And the people who know my brother, that's Minsin's, um, Minsin, my sister-in-law's husband. So it's just, it was really, uh, really hard times, but, but we made it. And, uh, and I went to the East Coast, and I um, studied uh, physical therapy assistant there. I, I was there for a few years, and by 1990, the war was over, so my parents, luckily, were here. And, um, you know, they moved eventually. And um, when I go back, I was trying to think, when was the first time that I really, truly uh, met Jesus or met, you know, met this God who is so loving. And I go back and I, uh, when I first came to U.S., I, I don't remember, I can't recall where it was. It was in a magazine. It was somewhere that I saw this, um, um, pain, this picture that is on the slides right now. And I remember... I saw this picture, and there was a writing. It was like kind of a poetry kind of thing. And there was a writing that a person who has gone through so much pain, through so much afflictions, is uh, asking God, uh, where were you? Uh, you know, there was this beach, and there were footsteps on that, on that beach. 
And this person is asking God, where were you? I only see one pair of footsteps on this beach. And where were you when I was in pain? Where were you when I was suffering? You, you, you say that you're with me, but where, this is only one, one pair of footsteps. Where were you? And I remember the next, the next thing that I read just blew my mind. He said, Jesus said, child, I was the one. Those are my footsteps. Those are my footsteps. They're not yours. I carried you through your crucibles. I carried you through those difficult times. And I was with you. I was with you. And I was holding you and carrying you. And that just, that was, I would say that was my first my first confrontation with Jesus, my, the first time that I truly saw that God, the loving God. And, and, and now that I look at it, um, I realize he, he started working on me then. He started, he is so faithful, he doesn't let you go. He started working on me on right then. And I, you know, I still was so far away from him. I was so far away still from him. And I got, um, you know, I was always very interested in uh, life and death. I was always, it was always my, even when I was atheist, I still was wondering what happens to you when you die? What happens, you know, about the whole journey that is called life? I was always a wondering person about it. So um, uh, I started getting into Buddhism and, and Hinduism, obviously. I was a, I was a, nature lover, you know, as I said, we were always in nature, so I, I fell in love. I, I fell in love with Buddhism and Hinduism and just the way they, um, they talk about Mother Nature and all those stuff, and I, and I started studying, um, you know, their stuff, and I, you know, I wasn't a practicing one, but I truly fell in love with those two, and I started... And I started doing tree huggings and, um, and really, really admiring nature and just thinking nature can do everything and, and, and the belief that, you know, there are phases of life and we go through all these until we reach that nirvana and, um, you know, we are gods, then we become gods and we are just so powerful and everything. And I was um, believers in crystals and all those stuff that we all know what what they are right now. I was thinking my loved ones, they reincarnate, they become butterflies and fly around me and all those stuff. So, and I look at, look back at that and I'm realizing what was I thinking? What, I did not even think for a second that all oh, these are creations of creations of God, a God who is so loving, a God who is so beautiful, who loves us so much, who, create, who has created all this for us, who, has, who loved us so much, who created us. And I just, again, I was so far away, so far away. My mom got sick in 2006. Uh, she had a major stroke. And uh, she, for three years, she was bedridden. She was, the last part of it, the last year of it, she was, uh, she was in coma. And it was so hard on me. I was so attached to my mom that I could not, I remember even in my 20s, I had a, I had a panic attack at some point just thinking about losing my mom. Just thinking about it. She was healthy at the time, and there was a, but I just loved her so much. And, and she had this stroke. And I, um, you know, I started getting more into, and now that I look at it, I'm like, that's why I got even more into Buddhism and Hinduism, because I didn't want to lose my mom. I wanted to hear that she's reincarnated, she's the butterfly that is around me, or she's here with me in the room. And I remember um, that I, it, it really got um, strong, uh, stronger and stronger, and she, I lost her. We lost her in 2009. And that's when things started really going crazy. I, um, I remember exactly um, when I was sitting in the garage. I needed some quiet time the day that we buried her. And I was in the garage and I'm sitting there. And I'm, in my mind, I'm talking to my mom. And we have this string that is hanging from the ceiling in the garage. And the string, I saw that it started to move like this, back and forth, back and forth. And I'm going crazy. I'm like, 
my mom is here, she's here, she's, she's talking, she's, she's, she's here, she's with me. And, I, I, and then the car started screeching. You know, the car was completely cold for hours. And then all of a sudden it makes these noises like as you first turn the engine off. So it started screeching and I'm like, I'm calling Brian. I'm like, Brian, look at this string, it's moving. Do you, it, there is no breeze, there is nothing here. And, and he was surprised. He's like, yeah, there is no breeze here. So, so this continued. So in my mind, I was there. I was just um, with my mom, and I'm just talking to her the whole time. And the, the scariest part happened two days after she, uh, we buried her. I was talking to Min Sin, my sister-in-law, that I was talking about her. And I was talking to her, and I, um, I was crying, and she was trying to comfort me. And all of a sudden, on the phone, as I'm talking to her, I hear my mom's voice. And my mom lost her speech during the three years of stroke. She had no speech. She could only say, you know, point at things or say, oh, it was a horrible, horrible stroke that she had. So, so I completely started hearing my mom's voice on the telephone. And I'm like, Mincin. Do you hear this? Do you hear my mom? Do you hear she's talking? And she's like, no, Arman, I don't hear anything. And I'm like, did Kayvon, my nephew, is he picking up the phone maybe? Maybe is he making all these noises? And she's like, no, Kayvon is not even home. So I started hearing these things and seeing these things happening in my, uh, in my home. Now, after I became a Christian, I, I realized what, what I did. I realized that I opened the door to so many, so many things. I opened the door to demons, to so many things that really haunted me for a while after that. I started having horrible um, panic attacks. I started having claustrophobias. It was just unbearable. It was to the point that sometimes I was driving and uh, just, just the fact that I had the seat belt on would make me claustrophobic. And I had to open it and almost at intersection, almost open the door to get out because it was so bad. They, they were just, they were just really attacking me. It was, it was horrible. And, and now, of course, now I know. Now I know when you, when you die, when you die, you go to sleep. There is no, no, no communication. There is nothing going on. And the breath and the body, God gives you the breath. God gives you, makes you from the, from the dust of the earth. Once those two are gone, you are gone as a living soul until the second resurrection. So I, I once I realized that, it, it, it really opened my eyes to what I was dealing at the time, and it explained to me what was happening to me at the, at the time. I, I, it was to the point that I was, I was driving because my mom was hospitalized in L.A., and I was driving. The, the nights that I was driving from there, I could feel this, not like a kick, like a pulse in the back of my seat. I mean, it was continuous. And I'm like, what is back there? What is... And, I never figured it out until later on I realized what this whole thing was. So, um, all the miracles, then after this, a chain of events started happening. Um, for years, I was struggling with health issues, uh, very painful health issues that my kids should remember. It was very painful, and I could not find it find a cure or anybody. I didn't want to go through surgery and I couldn't find any, any natural way to cure it. So, so I was searching on internet and I um, went on a patient forum section online and um, between hundreds of um, names that I saw on the forum, all of a sudden this doctor name just popped out that this is a naturopath and um, and I, I decided to go with him and, and just see if he can cure. And I now that I look at it, it was completely a miracle, completely a miracle. The way this one name came to me and I had to, to call him and he cured me. He cured me completely from the problem that I was dealing for 10 years. And it was horrible. It was so horrible and painful. So... Then at the same time, I pr practically changed my lifestyle, my, my, eating, my eating habits and everything. I was eating very healthy. And what happened is that I uh, 
followed this person on Facebook. And uh, this lady, this young woman, had her, um, the way that she ate was mainly fruits, uh, tropical fruits, very healthy fruits. And, and I became a fruitarian through her. And I started following her and, uh, you know, on Facebook. And um, I didn't know I was mainly interested in her fruitarian part, but I knew um, that she, she was, um, she, according to her, she was a Christian medium. So she would predict, predict the future for all the, and she had so many clients. It was unbelievable. She was so well off by, by doing the Christian medium kind of job. And one day out of the blue, um, as I went on her website, she goes, God has convicted me. Holy Spirit has convicted me. And I know this is not a job from God. This is not a job that I want to do. I'm, I'm announcing it here on this public place that I am completely back to God. And I am just, uh, yes. <laughs> and I'm completely, you know, I announce that I am, I'm throwing away all the crystals. I'm, I'm canceling all my appointments. I'm, I'm not going to have anything else to do with this. And, and once she announced this, I had no idea. I had no idea about medium jobs, Christian mediums. I had no idea. Once she announced this, from the day after, she started putting scriptures. She started putting Bible scriptures and a lot of Bible prophecies. And um, I became so interested in studying those Bible prophecies. I, I, and it was, it was like a second language to me because I had no idea about language of Bible. But it came so easily to me. I could, I could understand. I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. I can understand this. And I even ordered my, uh, my own Bible, which was King James, which now I'm thinking, how did I even read the King James? Because it's a lot harder than reading the other kind of Bibles. But I could understand. I started studying. I got so interested, so interested to study about Bible prophecies. And the, the next miracle happened. I was just on her, um, you know, all this stuff that she was posting. In one of the comments, somebody asked her, what do you think is a, a Bible-based church that I can go and get info and get maybe material from? There was only one comment and this, uh, you know, one comment about this. And she said, well, from what I have heard, uh, Seventh-day Adventist churches are pretty Bible-based churches. So maybe if you have a Seventh-day Adventist church, you can go there and you can get some materials and start studying um, over there, uh, Bible and Bible prophecies and everything. And I, um, you know, it just, that, that name stuck with me. By, okay, Seventh-day Adventist. So I need to go find a Seventh-day Adventist, find the, you know, the churches, and maybe I can get some material from them. And at the same time, um, you know, I, uh, one of my friends mentioned uh, the name of, she said, oh, I, if you're interested in Seventh-day Adventist, I know um, somebody who has really good um, sermons. His name is Walter Wheat. And you can, maybe you, you want to watch that. And I, and I started watching Walter. And it was just a world, a new world opened up to me. A new world that I could not believe how, um, how all these prophecies has been told to us. God has already told us about these prophecies and what his kingdom is and what, 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 are the, what is the whole process of these prophecies and what's going to come. And I, and I started falling in love, falling in love with it. So um, we have to realize that this was at COVID time. So most churches were not on at the time. It was through Zoom and everything. And I, um, I, I kept wanting to come. I figured out, okay, there is a Laguna Niguel one close by. Maybe I can go grab some materials and some booklets and come back home. And I kept procrastinating until one day it was like I just had to do it. I came I, um, and I... And I was out there. I was looking through the table outside there to see if I can find some materials. 
Uh, I, I came to the church first, to the parking lot. The parking lot was full. And I was like, okay, I'm going to wait for everybody to go in. Then I, I'm just going to sneak in at the table and grab some material. And, and that's what I did. I waited. It was 11. Everybody came in. And I went to the desk. And uh, as I'm going through the papers, uh, I hear this voice. Hi, how can I help you? Can I help you with anything? And I look up. And it's Barbara Snyder, <laughs> Barbara Snyder standing there at the table. And that truly was, was the divine appointment. That truly was a divine appointment because I had no expectation that anybody's going to be there. And I was so scared to really meet anybody. I just wanted to grab some papers and leave. And, and so I started telling Barbara that, yes, I want to I wanna study Bible. I want to know about especially Bible prophecies and the book of Revelation. And um, she was like, I can start a Bible study on Tuesday for you. And this was Sabbath. So I was like, oh, she's going to. So I gave my information to her. And I was like, there is no way she's going to call. There is no way. You know, it's that easy to get Bible studies. So, so here, here she, you know, I, I was thinking, okay, there's got to be another way I can find uh, booklets and stuff and get more info. And uh, she, she texted me on um, Sunday evening. And she said, okay, are we still on for Tuesday for Bible study? And Amazingly, amazingly, these Tuesdays up until a few months ago, we were still meeting every Tuesday. Every Tuesday, we started, we started um, reading the Bible. We started talking about prophecies. We finished, uh, we fi finished all the books, Revelation, Daniel, p prayers. We, we, we studied sanctuary. I mean, it was just... An amazing experience for me to learn all these. I, it was just a new world that opened up to me. That its foundations were love, was service to other people, and was prayers. Prayers. I just could not believe how prayer-based this church was. And it was amazing to me. And that's when... Um, Pretty much, uh, I started uh, taking classes with Pastor Mario for the principles of the Seventh-day Adventism. And I, you know, when they asked me if I want to be baptized, I was like, of course. And I became baptized three years ago, July 31st. And that was the day that my, you know, I, I cannot even believe what a beautiful day that was. And at the same time, my husband, Brian, joined after a while, and he... The interesting part is that he, at the beginning, he came um, one of the times, and he was like, I don't, I don't like this public praying uh, that everybody prays publicly. I kind of like private praying. And, and the interesting part is that now, when we go homeless feeding, he's the one who goes and prays with everybody. I mean, praise God, he's... He's the one who goes and, uh, you know, tell the person, um, would you like me to pray for you? And, and God changed him. God changed him. And the way he looked at everything got changed. And he started taking classes with Barbara. And he started, uh, and he became baptized uh, almost a year after me, a little bit less than that. But, but you see how God worked. You see how he, I mean, from that lady, the interesting part about the lady on Facebook that I was following, the fruitarian lady, she was not, to this day, she's not a seven-day Adventist as far as I know. She was not even a seven-day Adventist. And this is what really surprises me, that how did that one word that she said, oh, seven-day Adventist churches are good Bible-based churches, brought me to where I am. I mean, this, this just, it just amazes me how God works, how God works. The three amazing learnings that I've had during this, since my baptism has been, as I said, prayers. We have had so many. Barbara told me, oh, we have prayer groups. You can join them twice a week. And I, and I did from the beginning after I got baptized. And I cannot tell you the number of miracles that we have seen, the number of miracles. Um, you know, it's just been amazing. And I, I, can, I can name so many, but the two that really, truly, for the ones who know me, who come to our um, prayer groups, they know my sister-in-law. She's been dealing with cancer 
for so long. It's been nine years since she was 41. She was diagnosed with breast cancer, and it's gone really bad. Um, and um, we're, you know, we're at the point that I don't know how much more she has right now. It's in the brain, and it's really a sad story. But, but the miracles of God is that two and a half years ago, um, they realized the cancer has gone in the spinal fluid, and they, they practically said there is nothing else we can do, and um, this is it. She only has two to six weeks. So we started in the prayer group, we started praying so hard. We started every prayer group, every day, all of us prayed, prayed, prayed. And to this day, it's two and a half years later, she's still here. From two weeks to two and a half years. I mean, this is just unbelievable. So she got to see, um, her wish was to see her son graduate from university. She got to see that twice. She got to see three more birthdays of her son. And to me, it, this is nothing, nothing short of, short of miracles. Nothing short of a miracle. And I know she's not doing well. She's still here. Five months ago that they said they stopped everything. They stopped chemo. They stopped everything. She's still here. And I know, I know there is a purpose in this. I know she's suffering, but I know there is a purpose. And, I, and I'm asking God every day to just keep her com in comfort. And I know there is a purpose for her still being here. And I still cling on to his, to his promises, to his miracles. Because I have seen his miracles already. So, and the other person um, that was truly a miracle was Rich, who some of you might have met him. He's, he's the homeless, one of the people who was homeless, and he, he used to come here. We met him through homeless ministry. And for, for a long time, we kept praying for him. We kept praying. He, he kept going back and forth into rehab out of, you know, he, he was going to think about going to rehab. He did until finally he has been in rehab. And a little while ago, he was celebrating his uh, sobriety for um, six months. I know he's still in a, in a place like a rehab halfway home, but... He's, he's working, and the way God has changed him, the miracles of seeing him, how he has transformed, it's been amazing. I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go a little bit quicker. And, um, and my, other, my other learning was about Sabbath, that how important Sabbath is, how important this covenant, this covenant with our God is. He created us. He gave us everything, and he said that this is his covenant, this is a holy day for him, that we have to set up aside, we have to spend time with him, and we have to honor his Sabbaths. And it, and it amazed me how in today's world, um, unfortunately, we're not honoring his Sabbath. And um, I'm just going to skip the big parts that I had to talk about that because my time is short. How I came to homeless ministry... Uh, was another story. I just started it with Diana when she was doing it, and I fell in love with this. I was like, wow, this is amazing. We go out there and find the homeless. It's not like we're sitting somewhere in the cool air and, and people come to us and, and ask for food or whatever, and I loved it. We, um, we, we, we were communicating with them. We were just um, taking them food, clothing, and everything, and, and um, I could see, you know, I could see how Jesus is hurting for these people. They were, they were, they were, they were everywhere. They were everywhere, especially in Santa Ana when you go. They are everywhere. And they're, you know, whether it's their own choices that they made in life or whatever, but they're still children of God. And I, um, it really opened my eyes to what was going on in our backyards um, with so much money that we have, with so much comfort that we have here, what was going on out there. So when they suggested to me to take over the homeless ministry, I was very nervous, uh, but, I, but I took the job. And, I, and God, I cannot, I cannot tell you how many miracles have happened. I have come up here a lot and talked about some of them. It has been amazing. Every time that we thought we don't have enough, 
God has provided every time, every time. The connections that we have made has been just miraculous. Like walking on the street, we're giving food and somebody walks to us and says, oh, you should contact this guy and he will help you guys and he will give you. And that's how it's been. That's how we found the person who gives us the biggest donations of clothing. I mean, it has been miracles and miracles after another and it's been amazing. And one of the biggest Miracles of it to me is that some of you who know me, I have a really painful hernia. So when I started this whole um, homeless ministry, I was lifting so many boxes and I was like, oh, I I've got to go for surgery. And I didn't want to, but I cannot tell you that it's, it's been about two, two and a half years now. My, it's not healed. I'm not saying that it's completely healed, but my hernia is not. I'm lifting so much, and my hernia has not, it hasn't gotten me to surgery. I'm not even hurting anymore, and it's, it's only him. It's only him. I mean, I know there are simple things, but I know it's him. I know it's him. So, and now, of course, the Spanish church has, um, has joined us, and we have had so many new people who have joined us to, to come and help from everyone, from the people who pack the food, pack the clothing. I mean, miracles has been pouring. I have so many people that are helping us now, and it's, it's been amazing. Um, pretty much to the end of my talk, I just want to say, um, I want you guys to know that God is love. God is love, and love, love means that you don't, you give the freedom of choice. He has given us the freedom of choice. He has given each and every one of us that freedom. He's not going to force himself on us. He's not going to push the door open and come in. He's, Jesus is knocking at the door. He's, he's out there. He's not going to force himself. So open the door. Hear his voice. And I know, I know it's, it's really hard for, for us sometimes to do that because the world has taken over. Satan has been so busy deceiving us with social media, with, with the worldly stuff, with how we look, what car we drive, and all that. But please, hear his knocks. He's out there. He's, he's asking us to open the door for him. Pray pray. I mean, if I have to give one suggestion is to pray. Pray, even if you don't, because I had no clue how to pray. I had no clue. I was, I had no confidence in praying. And, and he taught me, and I'm still to this day, I just pray to him with my own words, with my own, you don't need to pray an elaborate prayer. Just pray and ask for help. And you will see his miracles. You will see his miracles as I have seen. And, and you, will, you will see what a loving God, what a loving, living God that we have. He's, he's waiting for us. He's waiting for, our, for us to ask him to help us. And um, I just want to... I just want to end my talk. I know I missed a lot, and I don't know. I really lost my place right now. I just want to say that the struggling, uh, you know, after I became baptized, I can't say life has been perfect and everything. No, no. I, I, I have been struggling really hard with a lot of issues in my life, a lot of issues, you know, with my sister-in-law, with other things that has happened in my life. And... Um, and my daughter is leaving in a week, yeah, which is really hard. But um, anyways, what I want to say is that by praying to God, he has given me such a peace, despite of all the craziness that is going on in this world and in, this, and in my life. And I'm sure each and every one of you have, have your own. So please, please don't forget to pray for him. Pray with him. Invite him to your hearts. You have to open your hearts. You have to have faith that he's a God who loves you, who wants to save you, and who wants to bring you to him. And I am, I am an example here. Someone from a Muslim country, from a Muslim family, he brought me all this journey to here, to bring me to him. And I, I can, to this day, I cannot even believe that I'm standing up here and talking because the people who know me from before, they know how timid I am. 
I'm never comfortable for public speaking, but God has made the tools. He brought me here, and he, um, you know, I come up here and uh, make announcements for homeless ministry. I go out there, and I talk to homeless, pray with them, and, and you know, it's amazing what he has done, how he has transformed me, and I pray, I pray that all my family and all my friends, they will eventually come to know him and to love him and to see his miracles as I have seen it. I will end my um, testimony with um, Isaiah 41.10, which is the, the little sticker that we always put on the backpacks of the homeless people. Uh, and it says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And he will. He will. Believe me, he will. So please come to him and believe in him. Open the doors of your hearts. And at this time, I'm inviting my two girls to come up. I know it's a bad time. They're crying, but, <laughs> but they're going to they're gonna play. Um... Thank you. <laughs> they're going to play Amazing Grace for you, which is my favorite song, which is the song that truly speaks about um, my story and uh, a lot of us, our stories, that how, how God works miracles in our lives and how he brings us to him. No matter how long the road is, no matter how difficult it is, how windy it is, he will make ways to bring you to him if you allow him to do that. So please do that. Uh, you, most of you know me um, uh, 